Uh, we have a, a, a great group of folks who are looking to run for the President of the United States, uh, and it's, it's great to be up here with you. Um, a lot of them were talking about how terrible it's been over the last six years and how much they would like to see something change. Well, three years ago, I actually tried to do something about it. Uh, I decided to, uh, to run for president against an incumbent president who had all sorts of money and against an establishment candidate who was sort of a given. He was going to win. He had all the money and everybody behind him. And a lot of folks decided to take a pass. We decided to step up and make a fight of it. I want to thank the people of Iowa for not listening to all the political pros, all the experts that said, oh, the most electable candidate is. What you're about here today, this is many of you maybe your first amendment of seeing a, a variety of presidential candidates. What you're about here today is an important mission. And that's a mission of trusting your judgment. Not what you see on Fox News, not what you hear on the radio, but what you see for yourself. You're not gonna, this won't be the, I guarantee you, won't be the last time you're gonna see me or a whole bunch of other folks up here and others, others to do. But I encourage you to do what you've done in the past, what you did in 08, what you did in 12, which is to look at the candidates and trust your own judgment. Do not defer to the experts. If you hear the term out of anybody's mouth of electability, run for the hills. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. What this country desires, and you know it because you do, they want someone who's going to stop the acrimony, who's going to bring this country together, and is going to do it with principles that made our country great. That's what we need, and I hope that's what I can help us do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. I want to start off again thanking you not only for educating your children, but bringing so many of them with you here today. The reason we educate our children, yes, it helps their earning potential, and we hope they will get good jobs. And yes, it's because we live in an aspirational society where we want them to do better than their parents. But the most important reason, the most important reason as a society, in part as individual moms and dads, is that we live in a self-governing republic. We need to teach the next generation to be critical thinkers for themselves and for us. We need to teach them not only to choose well when they go to vote in elections, we need to train the next generation of leaders. So I want to thank you for doing that every day in your homes, in your churches, in your lives. That is the most important obligation I believe we have as parents. As a parent of three young children, I know how important that obligation is. Now, for the, the boys and girls that are here today, you've heard a lot of us criticize and be critical of what's happening in our country. I also want to end by saying I truly believe in my bones our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. My dad used to tell my brother and me every day to get on our knees every night and give thanks to God Almighty that we were blessed to be born in the greatest country in the history of the world. And I'll be honest, as a child, I didn't appreciate everything my dad used to tell me as a child. Mark Twain said that the older you get, the smarter your parents were. And I understand what he was trying to teach me back that we are blessed. We have problems in this country, but we can get back on the right path. Our 40th president told us this. He said, every generation has to choose for themselves to renew those principles of freedom. Previous generations have spilled tremendous treasure and blood, giving us this incredible inheritance, the freedom to be born and raised in this incredible country. Now it is our time. And now it is our time. It is not optional for us to win the 2016 election. Not because we're Republicans, not because we're conservatives, because it is the future of our country that's at stake. I don't think we're beyond the tipping point, but I think it's only four more years of this president's policies, whether it's Hillary Clinton or whoever, and we will get to that point. It'll be very hard to recover, rediscover, recover, and restore the American dream, the concept of what America really stands for. I think we need a leader that is gonna make big changes. I think we need somebody who's been thinking about what they would do, not just how to get there. And I agree with what Rick has said. Look, this isn't about the insiders handpicking our candidate. This isn't about the smart people in D.C. clearing the field. You'll hear Republican leaders wringing their hands saying there are too many candidates. You know, there are too many discussions. There are too many debates. Well, by the way, this isn't a sanctioned debate, so you might be penalized if the RNC hears that. But you know what? Democracy is messy. And it is certainly, like Churchill said, it is certainly a lot better than the alternative. To paraphrase Buckley, I would certainly trust the first hundred American citizens rather than the so-called elites and the smart guys who think they run the Republican Party.
The most important thing I want to say in closing, the boys and girls that have come with your parents, we are blessed, and you are blessed, and you should say that prayer of thanksgiving to God Almighty that we're blessed in this great country. Our best days are ahead of us because our founding fathers got this right. The greatness of America is not in our government, our monuments, and it's not in rights created by our government. It's in the freedom, the rights that we were given by our creator, by God Almighty. And government's most important job, limited government's most important job, is simply to secure those rights. They may not understand that in corporate boardrooms, in the elite liberal media rooms, but they do understand that here in Iowa, they understand that in Louisiana, and I'm betting they still understand that in households all across this great country of ours. God bless y'all. Thank y'all so much. For it is not lost on me at all that uh, those of you that homeschool your children make an extraordinary sacrifice to do that. The sacrifice of your time and of your money. The fact that you've come here today and you've listened to us for a couple of hours, maybe the greatest sacrifice you've ever made. <laughs> the fact is, I want to say that I respect the fact that you love your kids enough that you're willing to swim against the tide. The easiest thing in the world is just to do what's easy. But you didn't do what's easy. You did what's hard, because it's hard to educate your children at home. You go through the scorn of some of your friends, and many of you have had the scorn of your families, who thought you were nuts, who criticized you. Some to your face, some only behind your back that you were aware of. And sometimes that criticism really stings and it hurts because Let's, let's face it, we all want to be loved, we want to be applauded, we want to be affirmed. Nobody, I can't imagine doing anything because they know it's going to cause them to have a bunch of enemies. We like to be liked. It's natural. So many of you have done what you've done to homeschool your children. Not because it was going to make you more popular with your neighbors, your friends, or the people even in your church. But because you believe that God had led you to do it because it was the right thing and the best thing for your children. If there, if there are enough Americans who have the same conviction about wanting to make the sacrifice for their country that you're willing to make for your children, there's great hope for this republic of ours. I fear that there will be a lot of people who will sit it out will say it just doesn't matter whether I vote or not, whether I get active or not, but it really does matter. When there's some 80 million people in this country who self-identify as evangelicals, not even including all the people who are pro-life uh, Catholics and pro-life members of liturgical churches and mainline Protestant churches, just self-identified evangelicals, and only half of them are registered to vote, and only half vote in the presidential election. I worry that there's not the passion, the interest, and the commitment that is needed to get our country back where it needs to be. You represent that passion for your kids, and I believe as well for your country. And I'm deeply, genuinely thrilled to be able to share the time with you this afternoon because I have sincere high hopes that if your passion for your children can be multiplied into the hearts of Americans who understand that it is our responsibility to stand up, speak up, to raise our voices against the abuse of our Constitution, the abuse of our family sovereignty, then our nation has great hope. If we don't, then shame on us. Shame on all of us. I want to say thanks to all my colleagues who are here today, and I, I look at them not as opponents, but colleagues. There are far more things that we share than that which we disagree with. And there's going to be a whole bunch of people on the stage over the course of the next few months all asking you to make one of us the nominee and hopefully the next president. And as that happens, what I hope you will do is hear our voices of what we're for not simply the voices of what we think is wrong with the other guy, because I close with this reminder. The worst information you will ever get about me 
comes from somebody else who wants the same job. The best information you will ever get about me comes from me. <laughs> Believe every last bit of it. And you'll be fine. Thank you very much. I want to thank each of you all for being here. I'll, I'll tell you it is truly a privilege to share the stage with three smart, principled leaders who fight for their convictions and, and, and three leaders whom I admire and respect. And I want to say to each of you that you inspire me. There was a time not too long ago where in the state of Iowa, the laws made it very difficult to homeschool. And yet, a great many of the men and women in this room stood up and changed the laws in Iowa to protect your God-given rights to educate your children. There was a time not too long ago when the Iowa Supreme Court struck down marriage. And yet, a great many men and women in this room rose up together and recalled three Supreme Court justices. There was a time not too long ago when Iowa was represented in the United States Senate by a liberal Democrat named Tom Harkin. <laughs> and yet a lot of the men and women in this room rose up and sent Joni Ernst to retire. <laughs> there you want to know how we change America? That's exactly how we change America. Scripture tells us there's nothing new under the sun. And I think where we are today is very, very much like the late 1970s. I think the parallels between Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama are uncanny. Same failed economic policies, same misery, stagnation, and malaise. Same feckless and naive foreign policy. In fact, the exact same countries, Russia and Iran, openly laughing at and mocking the President of the United States. And let me tell you why that analogy gives me such hope and encouragement. Because we know how the story ends. We know that millions of men and women rose up to become the Reagan Revolution. And it didn't come from Washington. Washington despised Reagan. It came from the American people. If you see a candidate who is embraced by Washington, run and hide. The reason I'm optimistic is the same thing. Let me tell you, all across the state of Iowa, all across this country, millions of believers, people of faith, common sense conservatives, courageous conservatives are coming together saying what we're doing isn't working. And that's what it's going to take to turn this country around. It is the men and women in this room who will determine if we continue going down the path we're on or if we pull this country back. Two months, two weeks ago, I announced my campaign for presidency at Liberty University. I will tell you the response we have seen has been breathtaking. The enthusiasm and support at the grassroots level has been humbling. Within hours, the New York Times explained, Cruz cannot win because the Washington elites despise him. Now, to be honest, I wanted to take that Xerox at 300 million times and send it to every American. But I'll give you one small measure of the energy and enthusiasm. <coughs> we set a goal in our first week of trying to raise $1 million. We thought that was a bold, audacious goal that would demonstrate we're going to have the resources to go the full distance and carry the conservative message. Well, I'm sorry to tell you we failed in that goal. We didn't raise a $1 million in a week. We raised a $1 million in one day. <laughs> Within 72 hours, we had raised over $2 million. By the end of the week, we had raised over $4 million. That came from 45,000 contributions in all 50 states, and 95% of those were $100 or less. That is the power of the grassroots. It's what y'all were able to do in Iowa, and it's what we have to do in this country to turn this country around. And so I thank you for your commitment to freedom, to our God-given rights, and to this country that every one of us loves with all of our hearts.
Thank you very much.